Welcome to another episode to our, um, of our podcast. Today, we're very happy to have Avi Stamen with us from Academic Language Experts. Welcome, Avi. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. It's a real pleasure to join you today, and I'm looking forward to our chat. Yeah, so um, we got to know each other through the EASE network, um, which is basically a community for European, but also non-European science publishers and editors. Um, and then we also um, a few times came across um, multilingualism, also not so surprisingly because that's where you specialize as is like with translations as an editorial service to researchers as customers. Um, but we, before we dig into that topic in more depth, would you like to share a little bit about yourself, how you like just a brief sketch around your career trajectory so far, um, your background and how you ended up now um, managing, coordinating academic language experts. Yeah, so uh, thanks for asking, Joe. It's kind of a funny story, um, to be honest. Um, this is my first job, um, and I've and I've had it now for about eight years, um, and now, you know, proud to say that I'm uh, the owner of a company, and we have about 10 employees, about 3,000 freelancers around the world, academic language experts. And, but really it all started by mistake. Um, back in the day when I was doing, finishing up my bachelor's degree, uh, I had an online course. Um, I remember it specifically uh, in the field of sociology of education. And my professor, um, I asked my professor um, if I could write my papers in English. I was studying abroad and he um, kindly agreed. And he was impressed with my English to the point where he asked me to translate his article. Now, at the time I did not know, you know, kind of how to write an academic article nor what translation really meant, but naively I said yes and agreed to his request. Um, and six months later, somehow slogged through and got to the end of, of the work. Um, and I realized that it's, for, I realized a few really important things already with that first paper. Number one is you really need to understand specific subject areas in order to be able to write about them intelligently or translate or edit or do anything you know, of consequence. Um, and number two is translation is really a profession and an art skill, and it's not just something that people do as a hobby in their free time. Mm. Um, I, I mistakenly thought that and ended up spending many more hours than I anticipated. So that was kind of sort of set the trajectory as, okay, I understand now what's involved and how difficult and challenging it is. Maybe there's a way to help additional scholars. Maybe there are additional scholars who are um, facing such issues. And kind of over time, it started as a language company with translation, editing, proofreading, um, and it has evolved over the last number of years into what traditionally known as author services. I like using the term author empowerment, but really trying to think deeply about how do we help scholars get from where they are, elevate their research, and enable them to publish with confidence. That's really what we're trying and aiming uh, to achieve um, because there's a lot more that goes into successful publication than just whether or not um, the text is, is, you know, is written without mistakes in English. And there's a lot that goes into that and we've built our entire business around helping scholars um, get from point A to point B. So, yeah, and that's exactly also what I hear often from scholars of any career stage really, where there's a lot of frustration around getting rejections for research or article submissions. And then the, the reason being the lack of um, skills in the language of English, um, either American or British or technical, whichever, um, or there's also international English. So funnily enough, there's also not one English language, but then depending where you publish, you have to one, you use one over the other. And that's even confusing for native English speakers, I suppose. Uh, so, um, so your your team. You mentioned you have around ten um, employees or team members. Um, are they all now native English speakers, or like, or like, of different language skills? And how is that beneficial? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, so I think you raise, a, first of all, you raise a really good point about the standardized English, right? I always, I always I sort of half chuckle, half cry when I see reviews that come in from, uh, from, from reviewers saying the English here is, is, is not correct, or I would have, you know, or they would have done it differently. Now there are grammar rules, obviously they differ from place to place. There are certain grammatical rules. And that's why we're very careful not to define our service as you know, correcting your English, because I think that really we have to respect the author's authority and the author's mode of expression. 
That's why we use the term elevate your research because we see editing as a lot more than just is this sentence technically correct or not, but actually is it written well in the sense that is it clear to the reader and the reviewer what exactly the ideas that I'm trying to convey. And I think that's really critical because if we're thinking about the goal being publication and mm -hmm. with the rejection rates as high as they are, even in the mid-level journals, it's really important that those ideas are conveyed in a clear and coherent manner. And as soon as I, as soon as I, as a reviewer have to start like, you know, scratching my brain to think, well, how exactly, um, you know, am I going to say this in a, in a, you know, how exactly am I going to understand this? Is it clear to me, but they can't focus on the arguments themselves, then all of a sudden you're at a disadvantage. And this is a disadvantage, by the way, that I'm sure you've seen these studies, Joe, that's proven in research, meaning um, non-native English speakers um, are, you know, you could call it bias, you can call it discrimination, but they are, they don't get accepted at the same rate as native English speakers, even if their research is of the same quality. So this is definitely an issue we need. So I sort of, it's interesting, because on the one hand, I would say I advocate for not you know, sort of forcing authors to go into one mode, US English or British English or, you know, um, but to enable them the widest spectrum as possible. On the other hand, understanding that in order for us to have a common language in order to communicate with each other, we need to be able to express in English in a way that's convincing, compelling, and really is understandable to the reader. And that's not a simple thing to do. Um, in terms of the staff, you asked me about my staff. So the majority of our staff are um, what we typically call English as a first language is English, um, you know, <clears throat> a mother tongue um, that, you know, varies there. We've got, we, we have Brits, um, we have uh, Americans. Um, we also have, um, but we also have other, other um, languages representative as well. So we have a, uh, a German native speaker. We have a Portuguese native speaker. It's important to me that our team is diverse so that we can really kind of not forget about our central mission. That being said, the majority of research is published in English. So mm -hmm. that's the majority of scholars that are coming to us, I would say about 75 to 80% are either translating into English or editing in English. There are There is a nice movement, and we can talk about this a little bit later on, of scholars or even, I would say, um, nonprofits that are understanding the importance of translating back into other languages as well, which we also do. Um, so you know, it's important to us to have kind of the staff ready to go and in place to be able to handle that those requests as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, Rick Archive, you are running a similar project um, translating from English and so six traditional African languages with a whole cohort of translators, professional translators and also science journalists. So there's a whole bunch of experts in different, in different niches, um, making sure that the, the science doesn't get lost in translation, which usually happens. And this is also a reason what I feel and always often advocate for that we need multilingualism in research because a lot of the information gets lost in translation if we focus in, on English alone as a presumed lingua franca where I'm probably very well aware of there's several there are because they have Arabic, we have Mandarin, they have Spanish. Like English is not the only scientific language nowadays, but well, for the Western journals, pretty much dominant, and also in, in the sheer numbers, probably very much dominant. Nonetheless. Yeah. So I, first of all, I applaud you for the work that you're doing in the African languages, because I don't think there's probably, there's probably nearly no research that's being translated into those languages. And I think it's probably, you know, can be very meaningful for the local populations to be able to have something that they can really use and, and, and benefit from. And that's where I make the real distinction. Um, when there is research, especially in the medical sciences or the social sciences, really across the board, but when there is research that has a local impact, right? Mm -hmm. We have to go back to our very basic fundamental question as a researcher. Who am I trying to speak to? Who am I trying to influence? Who am I trying to help? Um, and if the answer is a local population that does not speak English as a native language, then it should be part of your mission, whether it's in finding grant funds or whether it's in your the way you allocate your own research stipend to try and get your research into the local language. If it's research that really all you're interested in is communicating with your colleagues and all of your colleagues are perfectly capable of understanding, reading, writing in English, so then maybe it's not necessary. And I think that's really the real question that scholars need to ask is what is the point? Where do, what am I trying to accomplish and who am I trying to help? Um, and, and, and you know, there was one, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, Joe, in our previous conversation, but I, I once hung up the phone with a scholar and I wanted to cry because she was working on poverty um, 
with children, uh, a research that's that was her study of research in South America. And she was asking me uh, for a quote for editing in English. And I said, that's wonderful. But what's like, what's the goal here? And she said, well, it's to influence policymakers in South America. And I said, well, okay, why don't we translate it into, you know, Portuguese, into Spanish, into the local languages. Um, and she said, I would love to, but my university will only recognize it if, you know, it's a publication in English. Mm. So this really critical research that's going to actually have an impact on people's lives is being, you know, is being overlooked. And she would, by the way, I, I don't want to, you know, throw her in the mud. She really wanted to translate into Spanish as well and, and, and Portuguese and was trying to find funding to do that. But that was kind of the situation she was stuck in. So I think that's the real, if you know, message to funders and, as well as to universities um, is that think about who, you know, what, what potential benefit could come from, uh, from translating the research and getting it into another language. Yeah, totally agree. And that's also often, what, what, I, what I'm trying to sensitize researchers more and more towards is like, think about the purpose of your research. And then again, like how you get the message across to, as you said, to the stakeholders, to the beneficiaries. And these can also be policymakers. And then as you just said, they probably are not so good in English if they are policymakers in Northern, Central, Eastern Europe. So I, and, I think- yeah, I just wanted to add, it's important to have that in the research budget from the onset, like from when you go and set out the plan for the whole research project in the first place. Yeah, I think you're understanding right. And I think the problem becomes the incentivization of certain activities in academia over others. So what I mean by that is when you're up for tenure, they're going to be look, you know, most in most universities and colleges, they're going to be looking at, well, where did you publish? What's the impact factor? And, you know, and how many times did you publish? And I think that, you know, part of our job needs to be turning around to universities and saying, well, no, teaching is important. Well, no, um, foreign publication is important. Well, no, you know, influence, you know, I could, I could have a, a, a study that really impacts policy, whether or not that's going to help me in my career, crazily enough, it might not. Um, whereas if I can get an article into a high, high, you know, uh, high stature journal, it, maybe it does. So I, do, I think those are, those are sort of bigger issues that maybe Joe and Avi can't tackle alone, but, you know, hopefully I think there's, there are slow trends that are in place to push, um, you know, universities and funding bodies and, you know, promotion committees to look beyond just sort of the typical, how many grants, how many articles and, you know, high impact factor journals, and actually look at the full body of work in its whole sense and what it was able to accomplish. And I think that's really important. Mm. Yeah, totally agree. So um, how, how does a normal work day look like for you and your team? Like at what point in the publishing workflow do people approach you? with, with yeah. any request and what are the most frequent requests? Really good question. Really good question. So first of all, my personal day, um, I think the thing that I like most about this job is that I is that as much as I do have, I plan ahead and as much as I do have quarterly goals and annual goals, um, I don't know what every day is going to bring in. And I think that's the fun of anyone who's done, you know, been an entrepreneur is knowing that, you know, each day can bring its own surprises and challenges. And sometimes that's maddening and sometimes it's exhilarating and and, and, and sometimes that could be go from one to the other within a few seconds. So that's that's me personally. Um, in terms of the workflow and where we come into the process. So um, I, I like, for the most part, we are coming in as the glue. I see ourselves as the glue between the author and the publisher. And actually a lot of the services that we've developed um, have actually come to address this sort of gap where authors don't really understand what publishers need and publishers don't really know how to do a good job of communicating what they need back to authors. So for example, we identified this big issue when it comes to books that scholars really don't know how to put together a strong, uh, and I, I'm speaking in general terms, of course, but as a general whole, scholars struggle with putting together a strong book proposal. And sometimes that rejection will lead to them shelving the book project entirely. And sometimes all it takes is a little bit of guidance and coaching and help to understand, okay, what is a book proposal? Or what is an article as opposed to a dissertation? And what, how do we differentiate between those things? Um, or how do I go about you know, um, finding out if a grant proposal is potentially uh, relevant for me or not, right? All these questions that are sort of, um, you're supposed to kind of learn them somehow along the way, but no one actually teaches them in an organized manner. So part of what we set our mission to be is really to be kind of that silent, um, helper for authors and for scholars to really help them with publication because that's the end goal. Um, you know, I always say to to our staff, we could 
we can, you know, translate something like Shakespeare, but if they haven't followed the guidelines, if it's not in line with the aims and scopes, if it doesn't bring something novel, then it doesn't matter how good our translation is going to be. It's going to, you know, it, it will be rejected. So that's what we need to kind of align our, you know, services with their needs. Um, so that's really something kind of we focus on. So I would say it comes after the point the scholar has done their research, um, sometimes we even help, by the way, with academic coaching while they're doing the research. But uh, for the most part, scholars have finished their research. They put together some sort of draft. We, we tend not to write on behalf of authors. We, you know, there are ethical issues there. Um, and in general, it's not good practice for authors to come to us, you know, for, for writing. So okay. they'll write a draft. Sometimes it's more, you know, uh, uh, finished. Sometimes it's less. Um, and that's when we can kind of step in help them develop, elevate their draft to the point where they really feel like it's ready to go. And we really have a hands-on approach. This is not an automated service where it's kind of like you spit it in, you get an output and you go and run with it. Um, I really don't believe in those services. Um, it's, you know, every individual scholar works with us, works with an individual on the team um, to get their research to where it needs to go. So that's kind of takes them along that process. And the hope is once they're done with us, then they can go ahead and easily submit it to the journal of their choice, to the book publisher of their choice, um, and hopefully, obviously, receive a positive response. There are, we do also have um, more of a developing a business-to-business a -business approach, a B2B approach, where we're helping publishers and societies as well. So sometimes the work with them comes a little bit later on in the process where the authors have already come to the publisher. The publisher says, this is okay, but it needs some additional work. Um, the author, the, you know, the publisher will send the author back to us. And then we get involved at that stage. Um, so there are, you know, we, we do come in different parts of the workflow, but as a general whole, it's pre, um, you know, revisions and or, or pre-evaluation um, by the, the, um, the publisher. Um, we are also developing post-publication services where if you want to take your published research and turn it into a tangible um, written item, whether it's a, a press release or a media piece or a um, or, or something to influence policy, a policy paper, a white paper. Um, we're starting to do more of that as well. So that's another sort of service that's coming in later along the um, workflow process. Great. And um, do, you, do you find, like, because you mentioned that, or in my, my uh, probably na very naive observation is that many of the services that you are providing, I would assume are being provided by the publishers naturally or historically. But we find more and more, and also it's it's a standard that the formatting has to be do, done by the researcher. The, the yeah. copy editing needs to be perfect to go through um, acceptance and then towards re peer review. Um, what else? Like it has to be in a yeah, specific format, specific file type. The, um, so all of that, <laughs> what, what, and all the things that you just mentioned, you have researchers with, um, wouldn't that, or wasn't that in the past, whenever the past <laughs> happened, um, a natural, naturally inclusive service package for a publisher? And why yeah. is it not the case anymore? I mean, we can philosophize and, and be frustrated around that, but, and there's probably many publishers who still provide all these services, but like what made you, or where, how do you feel you're positioning yourself with your company now filling the void that publishers have started providing or, or kind of grading rather. Yeah, so the, the, the trend, it's interesting, it's kind of come full circle, and, but, but it's changed in a very important way. So let me try and explain. 20, 30 years ago, you're 100% right, Joe. If someone comes to publish their article, um, the most likely editing will be included, formatting, layout, all these things um, will be included as part of what the journal or the book publisher is gonna be doing for the author. Um, that, you know, that came to that you know pretty quickly um, came to an end in the sense that they realized they could offload these costs onto the universities, onto the individual researchers, have them come once they're entirely ready. By the way, globalization also sort of you know just multiplied the number of submissions that were coming into these publishers to the point where they probably couldn't handle them all, mm -hmm. and figured, okay, let's just turn it back on the authors and say until it's perfect. Um, it needs to, you know, you don't 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 send it to us or or send it to you know we'll publish it once it's you know sort of. Um, camera ready, as they say. Um, so, so they sort of slowly offloaded um, some of these services to external services. And we kind of came in, we were one of the players that kind of helped fill that gap to help authors try and get there. And I think there are, by the way, I think there are advantages, the fact of having an external service that's not biased by the end product um, and actually can help scholars really say what they want to say and, and mm -hmm. help them develop and, and realize their arguments. 
What's happened in the last five years, I would say more recently, or even, even less because of open access is that all of a sudden publishers who for a long time, to be honest, between us, Joe, didn't really give a damn about authors. All of a sudden they're kind of forced to give a damn about authors again, um, because they're no longer selling to libraries. I mean, they're selling in an indirect way um, via authors. So all of a sudden mm -hmm. authors have power to make important decisions. So all of a sudden publishers need to make um, the authors like them, um, which is not an easy thing after pissing off the authors for the last 20, 30 years. So what has happened now is that a lot of publishers are actually coming back and saying, well, we are offering these services. You still need to pay for them. We're not doing it as in-house, but we will bring in an external service such as our own academic language experts or other services. And either they will provide it as a partner service. So for example, we have a partnership with Brill. Um, where Brill authors will come to Brill, Brill will refer them to us and we'll help them get their manuscript ready for Brill. We'll send it back to them and then they'll pass it along to Brill. That's sort of one model. The other model is what's known as white labeling. And what white labeling means is that um, publishers will sort of um, not tell you who the partner that you're working with. They will be powered by one of the, by an author services company such as ourselves. Um, but they will put, they'll slap their name on it. So it'll be, you know, Wiley uh, Editing Services or Taylor and Francis Editing Services. And I think that, you know, I think that sometimes people can be mistaken because they think, oh, if I use Wiley Services or Taylor and Francis Services, my article will get accepted. And that's really not true. So people have to be careful. Um, um, but they may be using, you know, one of the author services companies out there and just not letting people know that that's what they're doing um, and trying to promote their own brand. So those are kind of two different ways of, of, of going about it. Yeah, with well, Africa Archive, I'm running also a, a, with a team, a preprint repository. How do you see preprints come in where researchers may consult you for your services before they publish a preprint and then go into journal publishing or the other way around, they share a preprint in whatever state they find it ready to be ready in and then seeking feedback on the preprint and then having further improved also for the editing and the language um, skills or the language data yeah. um, towards journal publishing. Like do, do you deal with, or do you have clients who say, oh, I have this preprint published increasingly and now I want this, to turn this into journal article so it needs a, a little ironing. Yeah, so so I want to clarify, first of all, that there's language services is sort of one half of the business. The other half of the business is what we call publication support. So you can actually get help with the writing process. You can get help with the um, academic review. So someone will review your research. You can get up with a book proposal. Um, these are all things and grant proposals. These are all things where we're kind of focusing on the science and the structure and not just on the, you know, polishing up the writing. So there are different ways that you can work with us mm -hmm. in terms of the question of preprints. So I think preprints are really interesting. And I think that as a general whole, I would say that, you know, the more that scholars can do, whether it's through, you know, crowdsourcing or through a professional service like ours to improve their, um, their manuscript before it's published, I think is a good thing. Meaning the more they can come to a publisher with something that's ready, the more chances they're going to have a smoother publication process. So we are actually um, behind the scenes in talks with a few of the big preprint servers to try and sort of integrate the services whereby someone can come, they can upload a preprint, um, then right afterwards, they can use our service, then maybe upload a revised version, um, a more updated version of their preprint, and then go ahead and, and, and pass it along to publishers and see who's interested in biting. So we definitely are taking, I, I think preprints are, you know, a very much a positive uh, direction. Um, I think it's really helpful for scholars to get early input and not have to wait six months for peer review, which is based on the grace of, you know, whatever reviewers may or may not be around and may or may not have time. Um, and so therefore, I think that there's no doubt that us sort of hooking up with preprint servers to send them, um, you know, to, obviously with the author's consent, but to pass, to make that transition smooth and then preprint um, servers passing along to us uh, some of their authors and research to, to help kind of what I would say is push them over the, over the edge and get them from where they are to where they want to be before they go ahead and send it off to the publisher is actually a really important, um, a really important step that's kind of really what one of the things that we're working on behind the scenes. Hmm. Yeah, my, I'm, I'm hoping and my idea of the future is also where journal, uh, journals and, and publishers would pitch to or authors for them to consider their venues to publish in instead of the other way around. 
<laughs> yes, I, because that's... it's already visible as a preprint. You, you know, some people ask, "What's the point in publishing in a journal if we wouldn't have to go to, through the prestige uh, dilemma with impact factor and that sort of thing?" Um, because once it's it's out there, it's out there. I mean, and if I could read it, what's the point in put, putting it through a peer review where we can also have crowd based and community based peer review, which is often much better than being reliant, as you just said, from on the time and availability and the goodwill of one or two individuals who may or may not personally know. Um, uh, so yeah, but, but I feel that journals and publishers still have a huge um, service to fill and maybe kind of remind themselves about that aspect as well in curating the content that's out there for us. Because as we all observe, there's so much research being published. Not There's not one researcher, I assume, who can conveniently say, I've read all the papers that are important to me in my research. Like that's humanly impossible nowadays. Unless, and especially if you look beyond English as a language for science, uh, which many don't even know exists, that there is research in their discipline, which is not English. <laughs> but, so yeah, but in curating the content, I think this is where, where we need journals and publishers very much and very urgently. Like, I don't know, that's a little bit of future scenario, but have you had time maybe also to even think towards these aspects? Like what's the, what's the future position of a publisher and also academic language experts as a standalone stand and still very versatile service um, in the next five or so years to come? Yeah, I, I think I think that the dream and the goal, right, is that if preprints become standard, right, and if preprints become what every scholar does, then by default it will become the sort of pool of 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 you know the the source of information, and and publishers will be fighting over each other to get the best research from the preprint servers, and then maybe authors, especially because some of these preprint servers really are you know nonprofits and they're really run I think for the right reasons as a whole, um, they will really be able to kind of um, authors will be able to kind of, you know, pick from the different publishers that are interested in their research. That would be, you know, kind of, I see the, the, the end goal. Um, I think that, you know, publishers are not going to kind of embrace this approach um, easily. And I think that it's the job of, of, of the academic community to push towards this because it just opens up healthy competition mm -hmm. and really lets the best research win in that sense. Um, and I think that's what's really important. Uh, the way I see our involvement in that process is, like I said before, is to be that glue, is to help those authors who, and, and, and our main our main clientele are authors for whom English is not their native language. So is, you know, is to get them on the same level so that if there is this, you know, sort of, um, I don't know what we want to call it, but this database of, you know, of research out there is to really make sure that every researcher's best um, expression of their writing comes to the fore. Um, and I think that's really important, especially as sort of, you know, I, to me, it's not important how prestigious a particular journal is. It's the rigor of the review and that of we course, can actually, yeah. re and yeah. that we can rely on the research that's being published. I mean, like, you know, what, did we even, did anyone not look, you know, learn from the pandemic that the general public, you know, you know, isn't, entirely convinced by scientific method and isn't entirely right and and there were some problematic papers that were published that sort of poke some holes in the you know veracity of the sci of the scientific method and process and i think that it's our job as the scientific community to get back to a point where when we're publishing something we know that it's as you know verified and checked and scrutinized as humanly possible mm -hmm. so that there so that when we come right how do we determine facts in this world? Well, you know, because scientists said it and it was reviewed by peers and that sort of what are what become facts. Um, but as soon as those facts start becoming challenged because we're not doing a proper review because there's a push to publish as much as possible, as quickly as possible, then I think it's a slippery slope. So that's part of our job is to really make sure that, that research is as clear, coherent, um, um, accurate and viable as possible so that what ends up getting published really is um is is valuable hmm. um i would like to if you if you like playing a little bit of the devil's advocate but there's nothing like i'm i'm not trying to undermine or, or send any 
weird messages here, but um, just coming from a point where I'm also not a native speaker, but I happen to live and was born and raised in Germany, which is pretty much economically strong as a country. Um, I found it because also German and English are you know, related languages, so English was not too hard for me to learn, but now I have a few friends in Portugal, Italy, also Kenya, well, Kenya often is the, uh, English is the often the first language also in Kenya and in Nigeria, but then also they, I mean, it's, it's then Kenyan and Nigerian English, which is also for some British or American editors seen as not good enough. So where I'm heading towards is, why should um, researchers already struggling with low budgets have to pay extra for language skilled services, which the native speakers who often sit in countries like the United States, prestigious universities who have lots of money, um, don't need such services. Or in other words, have you found a balance where you can sustain your business and also allow it to grow and invest in your team and additional services that you develop and all what's um, entailed in business growth um, and still have affordable pricing? Right. And for yeah, the yeah. customers who already stretched, probably. And yeah. Yeah. So we find that, and we, we did a, dip, a deep dive into this, we find that the difference between um, scholars who work with us and don't oftentimes comes down to what research funds they have available. And I think that the real emphasis needs to be placed on making language an important part of, of you know, funding mm -hmm. um, requirements and also grant proposals. So when scholars are going to, to pursue uh, research that the funders understand this is an important part because again language is just one piece i'm really getting back to the communication aspect mm -hmm. and how clear are we making our science and i think that it's not a matter of you know and, and, and that is really important regardless of what the native language is um so i think that it's really kind of critical to do editing regardless i even think that english native speakers should have editing done i don't think mm -hmm. they necessarily have the humility always to admit that it's necessary mm -hmm. um but we're so entrenched within the deep confines of our research it's hard for us to see the forest from the trees and understand kind of what really is you know what other people are understanding from our research not just what we're writing um and therefore i i don't think that we should be doing away with editing i or or you know just making it free or, or coming up with sort of automated processes which are half baked um which i've seen um you know there are a lot of scholars who think that grammarly is a solution for you know publishing their article and i really you know i, I strongly disagree with that um I do think that it's on the funding bodies and it's on, you know, to when they are funding to ensure the same way that with Plan S, we have sort of demands to make um, articles open access. There should be a requirement um, in funding proposals to uh, support language or editing uh, resources so that scholars um, have that available to them when they're going to pursue their research. Yeah, I totally agree. Also, I didn't mean to say like that either you should provide all these services for free, which wouldn't be sustainable, or um, also like what I just came to mind, which I knew before, but some somehow it keeps slipping off my, uh, I don't know, idea plate. Okay, now I'm making up words in the conversation. Like that's a struggle with two and more languages in one conversation. But what I'm trying to say is also the native English speakers would be well off, as we said earlier. A lot of the English research is on world regions outside English speaking territories. So there is a moral um, demand for making this research output available in those regional and local languages. So they better also consult you for your services um, to have it translated into in, uh, languages other than English. Correct. Yeah, 100%. Like uh, this brings us back full circle to the beginning of our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of take it for granted that everyone's going to be working into English, and English is the lingua franca of academia. But, you know, that may or may not be the best fit for each and every individual piece of research. So I, I, I get very, I've seen, we've actually been approached by a number of, of uh, you know, NGOs and, 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 you know, funding bodies who have come to us and said, can you help us with translating research to other languages? And I'm really happy to see that trend because I've been calling for it for a while now um, because I think it's really, really important to keep in mind who are we trying to help and really help them in the best way possible. So um, that's definitely something that, that I think funders should have in mind 
is, you know, are we helping from above? Meaning, are we just kind of saying we're going to help this population when it comes down to it? All we're going to do is publish a report in English, which they're not going to be able to understand. Or are we actually giving back to the population that we're studying and, and, and sharing the results of our study with them? And I think that's really important. So, yeah, I mean, if there would be, you know, if there could be organized sort of more organized ways of taking published research in English and trying to get them into other languages. Um, I know, for example, uh, at The Lancet, they're mm -hmm. doing something on a very small level, which I really loved because it didn't really take all that much. Um, but what they're doing is they're giving every author who publishes an article at The Lancet has the ability to publish a foreign language abstract. And that may seem like a small thing, but they actually could publish like up to, I think, six or seven foreign language uh, abstracts. And what it does is all of a sudden it makes that research available to scholars, or at least they can find it. And it doesn't necessarily mean they can read it or they can comprehend it. By the way, we also haven't talked about, you know, just the general population's accessibility to research, right? If I, God forbid, have a family member who's got, you know, um, you know, uh, cancer, I want to be able to understand their cancer and what the latest research says. If it's not in my local language, it's really hard to access that. And you'd be shocked in other language, when you do searches in other languages, how little scientific information there is possible. In English, we're kind of a little bit spoiled. Um, we've got articles about every toe rash you could possibly imagine, but in other languages, it's really not that way. Um, in fact, sometimes there could be really problematic information up there. So that's something on a, that's sort of a very little, little baby first step, but these are little things publishers can do in order to make, first of all, it's good for business because they're expanding the reach of their own research, which is their end goal. But second of all, I think it's good for science. Um, to expand, um, maybe to choose every year, every journal chooses two or three articles that they're going to publish in another local population. Um, we're doing this now for, for a journal based out of NYU. They came to us and wanted to translate a number of their articles from English to Arabic. And I really, I love it because I think it really helps the local population in a, in a real way. Yeah, this is also what we assumed would be easy with the Arabic archive or easily adopted rather, not so easy for us. We made it open for submissions in any, especially African languages, uh, yeah, language, be it French, English, um, Arabic, and also, I'm not saying but for reason, and also um, any traditional African language, and also Kiswahili, Yoruba, Kosa. I, could, I, I should be able to mention like several thousand now, but we don't have the time for that. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I know them all from the top of my head, but. Um, and then that never happened. We have a few submissions in French and one in another regional Botswana language. Um, and that's it. Like everything else is in English, but there's also in Francophone, Arabic, and um, Lusophone Africa. People are um, incentivized to publish in English for the most part, or they're not aware of any venues, or then probably aware, but they're not so commonly using English speaking venues. Um, so, and then we also felt that if, unless, like what now the Lancet has institutionalized, um, that um, if you see your research relevant, um, just please provide at least the title and the abstract and maybe a few keywords also in another language, be it your mother tongue, or if your article is in English, then provide a French translation of these three. And even the title would already be like, like what's what's your experience because because you said earlier of course i'm also aware because my aunt is a translator um that the translations is hard work and time consuming and is more than just translating you also need to convey the information into another language but do you feel i mean it depends how skilled the people the researchers themselves are with in a language and be it also the mother tongue to translate from english into that language and I, as a German, I have to say, I have difficulties translating any bio research that I'm used to from English. I would struggle for words to find in German. So, but, but to some degree, that's still possible, would you say? Or would you rather say, talk to the experts? Meaning, me? are you asking, can we self-translate or should we be? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, um, not for a whole research article, but maybe the abstract otherwise keywords probably doable and the title but already titles are often oftentimes so thoroughly defined and designed <laughs> or they should be <laughs> they might be difficult to just put them not randomly but into another language and they yeah. might end up being super long but anyway yeah, the, the the issue with translation so keywords i agree with you usually scholars are familiar with keywords um, that they need the the issue with the other parts is that 
there's translation often, if not always, includes some sort of cultural adaptation. So even if you can find the right words, doesn't necessarily mean that it will have the impact that you want it to have. And it's really important to have someone who, if it's your own native language that you're translating back into, then go for it. And you're entrenched in the population. But we even see issues with, for example, we had a German translation from a good German translator, but she's was in the States the last 25 years. And it seems like she, mm. from not being in Germany, it actually impacted her ability to really understand the cultural nuances that needed, mm. that were needed. So I think that's really important when you're going to think about whether you're gonna translate something yourself or send it off to a, sure. to a professional translator is, do I feel like, A, I have the language skills in order to do this without making embarrassing mistakes, but B, do I understand the local culture, population, research scene enough to, to actually say something with meaning for them so that they will then go and want to um, continue? And especially if it's something small like an abstract where it's not very costly to begin with, um, I think it's just worth you know the potential upside of having people access and benefit from your research. Um, you know, I think it's worth you know, seeking out, knocking down the doors of your head of your, you know, research dean and saying, this is something that's important that I want research funding for. In my experience, and I don't want to oversimplify things because I know it's not that easy, but in my experience, scholars who really take their translation project seriously and, you know, turn around to the research departments and look for funding. And maybe this is something we can share in the show notes, Joe. Um, I have a list of funding um, bodies and are willing to apply for funding for, you know, especially for longer projects such as books. Um, eventually they'll, 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 they'll get it. And eventually, you know, you work hard enough and you'll be able to do it. So, you know, it has to be a priority. It has to be something you're willing to dedicate time and effort to. Um, but there is, there are opportunities out there to get your, you know, to publish your research and, and, and start with your own local, you know, kind of Dean for research or your research uh, coordinator. Um, and then if that doesn't work out, then, then, you know, start looking around online um, because that's really important. And like you said, Joe, the best thing to do is when you're applying for any sort of funding for any sort of fellowship grant, stipend, whatever, make sure to put in a line there about translation editing. Even if you don't know exactly what you're going to be using it for now, um, it will, it will benefit you in the long run. Yeah. I'm not on the budget for that item because it's usually more than more expensive and more time required to get it done properly than yeah. you might assume, as you also experience in several. Of <laughs> yeah, and people come to me, by the way, people come to me all the time to, you know, with, can you just help me figure out how much approximately this is going to cost, even though the project's not going to happen for another two years. We're happy to help people kind of consult with them and say, here's an approximate of what that's going to cost if you're trying to include it in your research budget. So, you know, you don't need to be shy. Um, as you see here, you know, uh, you don't need to be shy you can always um, approach me and, and and ask me for help with working out your budget, um, specifically with the line item that has to do with language services. Mm. Yeah, it's great to know that um, company service providers like yours exist because we, we need you <laughs> as a scholarly community, um, increasingly globally inclusive, um, and also like in, in both directions, from English to other languages, from other languages into English. And, um, Maybe like con concealing with or coming to an end because we're almost reaching an hour by now. And um, it feels like I could continue or could continue forever uh, as a um, huge topic. Like, are you, are you sometime or are you referring to the Helsinki Initiative at times? Is it like providing good arguments for, I don't know. I mean, your services are a self-explanatory and by the time people approach you, um, it's just a, like I I became being multilingual myself or um, like speaking English, uh, German of course, Swedish, um, a little bit of Kiswahili, French. I have French in school. I wouldn't say I'm fluent anymore, unfortunately. Wow. I think it can be warmed up again. But and then when when I came across the housing initiative, it was like what? Of course. But it, like you know, it's it's not so obvious, unfortunately. But it should be. So I don't know. Has that influenced the work that you do at Academic Language Experts at times? Yeah, so um, why don't you share with me? I don't know if every, I'm curious, I don't know if all of your readers necessarily are familiar with the Helsinki Initiative. Do you wanna say sure. a few words about it? Of course, sure, yeah. Um, so the Helsinki Initiative is basically a, um, a, a declaration of some sort um, on multilingualism and scholarly communication. Um, giving several reasons why it's necessary and which stakeholders in the academic system should 
um, consider it for the obvious reasons. So, so like we said throughout this conversation, funding systems and funders should of course have or provide budgets um, that it's in like egg, what, what's the word, like super important to consider to have um, not only, but especially for regionally and, and locally relevant research and also to serve a global research community. We cannot consider ourselves global if we only communicate and accept English as a language for science, like that's not global. Um, yeah, I, so, I mean, obviously I fully support the Helsinki initiative and, and you know, and, 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 have, and have signed it myself. Um, and I think that, you know, I put it this way, I don't know that necessarily a, you know, the, to me, the Helsinki Initiative is really most powerful um, when brought to funding bodies and when brought to bigger publishers. I don't know if we need to convince the, the local, the authors of this. I think authors would love to do this. I don't think they need convincing, twisting their arm. I think what we need to do is enable the systems, you know, empower them to have access to funding to be able to um, to really do this properly. Um, so it's definitely something that I bring up in my conversations with executives in the public, in the academic publishing industry. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the conversations need to be had, because I think as soon as you had that opportunity and opening, I think scholars will, aside from, aside from the importance of it, and aside from it being a valuable as another way for people to accept it, I think people, A, can express themselves in their own language in a really deep meaningful way that they might not be able to in in, in English even through translation mm -hmm. and B take pride in writing in their own you know native language and especially when it's something that represents their country it's something that they communicate with their peers in with their family um so I think that that's you know uh, I think that we're sort of preaching to the choir if we're talking to authors um but I definitely think that this is um you know something that we should be pushing out more into the public uh you know mindset so that people are kind of aware of it and sign on and it, it gains steam over time. Yeah, I feel the researchers like also myself might not, I mean, they might, ease, um, might easily buy into the idea of multilingualism, but then be stretched for the time, the capacity, the skills, the, the budget for doing the translations. And for that, but we might need the researchers as like to advocate with us for yeah. Through yeah, you're right. You're right about that. I, I agree entirely, Joe. I think you're you're entirely right about that. Um, and then, yeah, and the Lancet now um, providing a good example um, on how this can be easily achieved also from publisher side and then funding should be automatically there. And like, it's, it should just be a matter of checking a box or not even um, like it should be obligatory to consider at least one other language to to translate the uh, outcomes into. And how great how great would it be if publishers actually paid for that? I I think there's a business case actually to be made for publishers translating their research um, mm -hmm. if they were intelligent and smart about it and could figure out how to you know upsell um, additional languages that are relevant to their readership. I think 100% there's a business case to be made. The cost for yeah. translating a handful of articles that are already being published is small compared to the potential reward of, you know, and, and, and additional benefit of localized research. But that, that, that's gonna take some more, um, you know, building out a real business case that, that, that really supports that. Mm. I think some small publishers already do that naturally because they publish regional research, which would be in the regional language and English on top or the other way around. But yeah, the other big publishers are, have a lot of opportunities here. Yeah, I, I think that whoever jumps on the, you know, the opportunity of, of foreign language publication, either translating foreign language and publication into English as a business strategy for a publisher to be able to expand their titles or flipped, taking research that they've already published and translating into local languages that will actually read it and have an impact. Um, I think that whoever does that first will really benefit um, both, you know, scholarly, both in a scholarly sense, but also in a financial sense. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Thank you so much for, for your time. Is there any any last call to action you would like to shout to the listeners? Any last statement, concluding remarks? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, two things I would say. First of all, anyone who wants to reach out and connect, um, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So Avi Stamen um, is my name, uh, A-V-I-S-T-A-I-M-A-N. Feel free to connect with me there. You can, um, you can follow us on Twitter. That's at ALE Translation. 
Um, and also we do a monthly publication success interview series uh, where we interview thought leaders um, about uh, publication. It's really trying to bridge the gap between authors on the one hand and academic publishers on the other. Um, so I really highly encourage you to check that out as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can just Google that um, and, and it'll come up. And obviously, if anyone does want any um, you know, individual help with translation, editing, academic review, um, anything having to do with academic language um, services or publication support, um, you can reach out to me via email. My email is avi at aclang.com. That's avi, A-V-I at A-C-L-A-N-G dot com. You're also welcome to reach out through LinkedIn networks just as well. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward. Hopefully that, uh, you know, I hope that our conversation today has been of interest. People who made it this far, clearly we've done something <laughs> right, Joe. Um, I thank you for you for the invite. Um, I'm honored to, to be on here. Um, and I hope that this is the beginning of, you know, a series of conversations on important topics. Yeah, I hope so too. I'm pretty sure it will be. And the honor is all mine. And <laughs> again, thanks for your time, for sharing your wisdom and speak to you soon again. Thanks, Joe.